Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Wednesday, February 24th. Derek Van Riper here with Eno Saris. On this episode, we look at some draft strategy topics. We're going to talk about KDS. Where do you want to be in the draft order? If you get to choose your own draft slot in 2021, how do you make that decision and where do you want to be? Uh, we have a lot of keeper and dynasty questions and a few follow-ups coming off of our relief pitcher preview episode that went down on Monday. So a lot to get to today. Eno, how's it going for you on this Wednesday? It's good. I had two really weird thoughts uh, while walking the dogs today. One, is a dog walk forced calisthenics? <laughs> I have never stopped to think about I that. Think, I think they like it. I think it's okay. But sometimes on the colder side, you kind of wonder. <laughs> Uh, and you like you you tug them a couple times too much, and you're like, are they enjoying this? Uh, <laughs> second, and this is a little bit even weirder. Um, if we are in the apocalypse, you should probably eat the dogs early, because then you can eat their dog food. <laughs> awful, dude. Just awful. Wow. Yes, this is this is where my mind was this morning. <laughs> Jeez, At least a... one thought was sympathetic towards a dog. The second was probably when I got annoyed at them barking at somebody. <laughs> you have a very different relationship with your dogs than, than I do with mine. That that thought has never crossed my mind. I did think <laughs> my weird thought of the day, since we're just unpacking everything, is I stepped outside for a morning dog walk. I had to walk down to the coffee shop today. I haven't done that probably since October. There's a coffee shop in my neighborhood. It's awesome. The that ice flows there. broke apart. And <laughs> yeah, right. We only almost <laughs> fell like five times. Like <laughs> we could actually see concrete to get there. Nice. My thought was that there's a glitch in the simulation that I am being Truman showed because I have a few neighbors who only walk by when I am going outside. And it's two different <laughs> sets of neighbors waiting for you to come out. <laughs> it's one or the other. Every time there's the people that live in my building that just don't acknowledge us as people. They just, you could say hello to them and they just would pretend like you didn't say anything. Their dog uh -huh. is cool. Their dog's quiet. So no problem there. And then there's this uh, older couple that has somehow two poodles. I don't know why they have two. The dogs are not trained at all and they're bigger than my dog and they bark at Hazel all the time and mm. basically try to fight her every time they walk by, even if we're not outside, their dogs will pull into our yard at our window and start barking at Hazel wow. while she's like laying on the couch or laying on the bed. So I think there's a simulation glitch because when they're not there, it seems kind of weird because they're always <laughs> there. So those are our weird thoughts. That's what happens when you walk a dog enough times. You start thinking about weird stuff. I've never <laughs> yeah. thought about eating one. Like Eno. To be clear, I'm not suggesting... We should eat. I'm glad you're clarifying that because that's probably going to end up on a Rotoware <laughs> no shirt. There's already a shirt of you stabbing our Murdering friend Justin Mason. Justin Mason. <laughs> yeah, that, that and I didn't even. I didn't even say. I didn't. I didn't say anything about them, Justin. I don't. I don't harbor any ill will towards Justin. <laughs> and yet here's the shirt of me stabbing him to death. So, while holding uh, a sandwich, how cold yeah. are you? <laughs> Yeah, there's like different versions. There's one with me and the sandwich, one with me and the beer. Well, <laughs> I I appreciate the ingenuity. <laughs> yep. I had to stop tweeting pictures of food because Kenny from Rotoware kept photoshopping Justin Mason's face into my food. It's and then when really I would actually weird. eat the food, I would just see Justin floating in a bowl of soup and I couldn't couldn't do it anymore. Let's get to our first topic on that note. Uh, KDS, uh, choosing where you are in the draft order. It's uh, a big deal, if you, especially if you haven't done it before. And it's important to get it right relative to how the board shapes up and what your preferences are as a player. You know, with TGFBI drafts starting up on Monday, I figured today was a good day to bring this up because a lot of people are doing this for the very first time. and Got to remember to set them, yeah. <laughs> a, remember to do it. And B, have an idea of what you actually want to accomplish. Because if you're lucky enough to draw one of your first choices, you should take advantage of that. So uh, I wanted to ask you, what do you consider as you are putting your KDS preferences together? I mean, there's the, the high level, you know, analysis of what's happened in the past. Errol, Errol Cohen did some of this and his findings were that uh, the, the middle was uh, slightly more beneficial than the edges. Um, and I think that has to do with runs. Um, you know, there could be a run on any position, closers, starters. Basically, I, we've talked here on the value of thinking about tiers. 
if you if you're near the end you may see the tier end before you can pick within it um and if you're in the middle you'll have more more information every time you pick if you pick on the end you'll have this you'll have one amount of information for two picks right so there's the there's a difference in information um however the other thing that you have to do is practical you have to think about the theoretical and then you have to think about the practical and the practical has to do with how the, sh the shape of this year's board the shape of the, the the players where players are going and what you will actually end up with for likely you know as a as an example you know um i am doing a draft a draft and hold draft champions uh league and it turns out that I'm a basic biatch. <laughs> because if you do the ADP by board, uh, you know, you can do it actually on, on, on uh, NFBC. You can actually look at the board um, in ADP style. I went Yelich with the 12th pick, which is perfect match. Bueller in the next round, which is a perfect match. In the third round, Gallon fell to me. Uh, which was like sort of a six six pick fall. Uh, I picked Gallon, got a bunch of good picks in the in the draft in the, in the thing. Starling Marte is who I should have picked by ADP, and I did. And then Ke I wanted to have Keston Hura in the fifth. He didn't fall to me, so I reached three picks for Cattell Marte, um, and then that set off a cascade where I reached three picks for Yardon Alvarez in the next round. However, in all, I was about you know, five picks off of being exactly what ADP would project. So I think it is valuable to look at this board and say, ooh, if I pick six and I'm likely to take DeGrom, like which bats will be available to me? Oh, it'll be Manny Machado at best case scenario and worst case scenario, I'll be picking between like uh, Bo Bichette and DJ LeMahieu as my second bat or Kyle Tucker all of those seem kind of reaches in the second round for me. Um, you know, then I'll be forced into kind of a two starter double tap. Now my best bat is going to be Ozzy Albies or Eloy Jimenez. How do I feel about that? Is that how I want to start out? If I don't want to start out with a double tap ace, I better say my preferences are, you know, somewhere else. So that, that's sort of how I kind of thought through the process. Yeah. I think that's a great way of looking at it. And my, process has changed a little bit over the years to become a little more robust when i first started playing nfbc leagues which are the only leagues initially that i played in that had this i think more home leagues are starting to adopt this because it's a really fair way or a more fair way to build a snake draft order just because you know you hit the random button doesn't mean everybody's happy you can actually make people a little happier if you randomize choosing a spot and then custom making the draft order so i would highly recommend making this modification if you're playing in a home style league where you're like, we're doing a snake and we just draw it and everyone just does what it says, you can do better. And it's not that hard to do this. Uh, I think I look at it similar to how our friend Scott Jenstead over at Rotowire does it. And Scott's a great long-term NFBC player. He looks at the first four rounds, looking for where he thinks the drop-offs are with steals and starting pitching in particular, which is you know unique to the current board and, and probably pretty unique to the boards of the last couple seasons. Uh, but I, I think that's the type of mindset that you want because you know after the first four rounds, it becomes a little more difficult to script out who's actually going to be there. Even within the first four rounds, there's going to be some movement, but I feel like you can take some more educated guesses, right? You can kind of go a process of elimination. Uh, I think if you're looking through having that idea, like you said, of do I want two pitchers right away? Do I want two in the first three rounds? Am I okay not being as aggressive with pitching? That dictates the order a little bit. Uh, whether or not you like getting two picks at once, that's a factor as well. I like having two picks back to back. I think I'd rather have more control over my team by picking two players at a time than get the little increase in value that you can get by being somewhere in the middle, right? Like you can optimize value better based on the Ariel Cohen studies if you're not on an end. I feel like I'm better off just making a team two at a time because Yo. my strength is as an auction player. And I think two picks at a time is more like being in an auction than being stuck in the middle. I also feel like it's a slightly more aggressive stance than defensive, right? You know, on the edges, you can say, I'm going to create a run. I'm going to, I'm going to deplete a tier, right? Like if you don't have a shortstop and an MI and you, and you double tap, you know, uh, Hura, uh, Baez at the right moment, 
you know, I just sort of, I'm just guessing, but you know what I mean? Like if you do that at the right moment, you will tighten some sphincters, if you know what I'm saying. So there is something to that. But generally when I look at the, the first two picks, whereas I'm, I, that's, that, I'm actually almost two, but four makes sense. But I, I think almost the two is the foundation that I want to think about. Um, I like 10, 11, 12, best i like 10 11 12 best you're going to end up with jose ramirez trevor story yelich maybe you get turner you're going to get one of those bats i like all those bats and then the second round you're going to get your pick from sort of bueller castillo nola flaherty woodruff i have woodruff like fourth or fifth in my rankings i'm gonna, i might be having a high man but just being able to do that i like that just looking at adp you know i do also love tatis woodruff um if that's if that's like going to be a possibility in your league but i i think woodruff is rising um in adp and i think that'll be less likely to be an option for you going forward yeah i think he's going to be a late round two maybe an early round three guy in 15 teamers pretty consistently we're already seeing late round two but he could creep up and be maybe a mid-second rounder in some of the higher stakes gonna, situations yeah i think he's gonna get past max scherzer you know back issues uh you know better projections and flarity uh i think he i think he could hop those two and if he hops those two and it's tatis and flarity tatis scherzer eh, you know okay soto scherzer i i I think i actually like one two three uh after i like uh 10 11 12. i'm trying to decide how far down in the first round i would go i I still want to be earlier rather than later first so am i counting backwards from five or am i counting backwards from seven I, mean, I see mike trout in the middle of round one and i think wow it sure would be nice to have that fall into my lap and if he doesn't fall there trey turner's probably going to fall there and if it's not turner maybe one of Degrom or cole is going to be there i think seven seven eight is pretty is pretty interesting that because of that trout and trout or turner and then you are in the middle which supposedly is good and then you get uh, a higher choice you could take woodruff there and, and nobody would blank right but you'd also choose maybe castillo or nola gets to you right so i think as it stands right now and i have not set kds for any of my leagues yet other than draft and holds eight to one and then maybe 15 down to nine might be the way i go i i like being on the wheel though i really i don't mind being aggressive i don't mind breaking off adp i don't mind setting the min pick for players some people aren't comfortable playing that way some people feel like they're overpaying if you feel like you're overpaying and that puts you on tilt and then you start making bad picks stay away from the wheel make that your last choice if you're that kind of player it just doesn't bother me to be in that position but that's very much a a personal preference i know john legeza our guy mlb moving averages loves being on the wheel whether that's the beginning or the end of the round he loves being there 12 team or 15 team or uh, doesn't matter one other really interesting tidbit this is from fred zinke on twitter great player in tout wars labor plays nfbc too uh adp in the first two rounds is what he's looking at rounds three and four a little but not too much his kds most years he says is typically one to 15 but not this year. So normally he just leaves it. He just says, I want the earliest possible pick this year. He's treating differently, which I think kind of goes back to something we've said throughout this off season. We're dealing with such a small season in 2020 that there's a lot of noise in last year's production. I think the recency bias is Mm -hmm. always a factor in, in how players are valued, but the recency bias is even more flawed than it usually is when we're talking about players with 60 games or less from the most recent season. So I think you can take advantage of that by being a little later in the round. And all of this is a long way of saying, like, think about the strategies, think about how the board comes together. I would agree with Scott thinking about where starting pitching and speed is in particular this year is a really good way to go about it and base your decisions on those factors. Because if I look at the back part of the round, thinking about speed for a moment, there aren't a lot of players in the three, four range that run a lot that are there. Tim Anderson's usually gone by the time you get to those last few picks in round three. So you're looking at the hitters, the, the mostly corner infielders, Jose Abreu, Rafael Devers, Anthony Rendon, Nolan Arenado, Alex Bregman. I like all of those hitters. Closers start first, showing up there. Yeah, you start to see the first closers getting pushed into the middle part of that round sometimes. You're not getting speed in three and four other than maybe Starling Marte 
or if you want to push up Randy or Rosarena. And I think Randy is going to get pushed up in really competitive leagues and high stakes situations for that very reason. This feels, yeah. But I think if you're going to be late in round one in terms of where you're picking, you probably need to get speed in one or two or be very comfortable either pushing up Rosarena or being very comfortable with Starling Marte. I like Marte. I think there's one more really nice year from him. Maybe it's 15 homers and 25 steals with a good average. You're not worried about playing time at all. So where he's going, I really like him. But if I'm picking, let's say, 9th, 10th, or 11th in the order and going through in round three, I don't get someone who runs and I haven't really got a lot of steals yet because I was a little aggressive with pitching early. There's a chance that Marte goes at the end of three, early part of four before it comes back to me. And if both he and Arosa Rayner are gone, you got to have that plan B ready where you say, great. That 20 plus steals guy I thought I was getting in round four is gone. Where am I going to find those 20 steals that I feel good about in the next few rounds? And it, it's possible. And it's, it's possible. I to think do that it. happens with that happens a little bit with three, I think. Soto. Hmm. You know, as good as Soto's going to be, you get about 10 steals from him. In the second round, if you decide I, I need to have a pitcher here, and that's totally defensible. And I, I'm feeling that way now these days, is I want one a pitcher in the first two rounds. Uh, then you're going to pass on Kyle Tucker and you're going to take Woodruff for Flaherty. Okay. Now you got 10 steals and you're two rounds in third round. Um, if Robert doesn't fall to you, then you got to pick Albies to get those steals, right? Now you're, you're pushing Albies a little bit and there's people who don't like Albies. What if you don't like Albies? Then there's no obvious uh, steals to take there. So you take whatever you're going to take. It comes back to you in four. Starling Marte has gone by the time you pick. Randy, Randy Rosarina is gone by the time you pick. Whit Merrifield is gone by the time you pick. So now you're going to push Grisham, maybe? So you Those... think about steals. I think that's right. Think about yeah. steals. Think about where you want to get your steals. It's not like an auction where you can just pay for steals if you want steals. It's you got to, there's limited, like I said, there's about 18 players you want to pick from for steals. And if you can identify where they are, and you know, that's going to be part of your KDS process. Right. And if you feel good enough about the options you're going to get for your primary sources of steals in the round five to 10 range or five to 12 range, wherever those lines are for you, great. Then you're fine picking in the early part of the round, you know, going like if you're going to push Buxton. Like yeah, yeah. If you're going to push Buxton or you're going to push Robles, then that's fine. Then that's, that's good. That's your process. I but like those players. So I'm perfectly those. fine relying on them as if not my main source of steals, maybe my second or third most prominent sources of steals. And I think the price on those players is really fair. So you have to sort of match how you feel about different parts of the player pool with what's likely to happen and work accordingly from there. But as I said, I think I'm more like eight to one in terms of my preferences right now. And then probably working from the back in a 12 team or you know, 12 down to nine or in a 15 team or 15 down to nine. The first round pick's not the problem. There's, there's a first round pick that you love in every spot in the first round this year because of the, the weirdness of last year. It's those next few picks where things can get uh, pretty messy. And I, if you want to push me dollars, dollars to donuts, baby. I don't know what that means. Love say it. Dollars to donuts. I love both of those things. Um, I will go. Um, I, I, I really think this is how I'm going to go. Uh, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3. Hmm. 13, 14, 15. And then back That's, into the middle and early part? Yeah. And I think it has to do with um, the shape of second round pitching. I want to have a pitcher in the second round. I don't really want to pick in the Scherzer, Flaherty, Kershaw area. Hmm. Uh, I love picking between Bueller, Nola, Castillo. So whatever I can do. And then one, two, three, I kind of like because I, I would just take Woodruff. All right. So, and then I would, I would, feel, and I also feel like it's a drop off in talent where maybe with bets one, two, three, four, maybe I'd go to four. I think those are clearly the four best. Trout is, is there too, but I just, um, yeah, yeah, okay, maybe five. <laughs> but I like 10, 11, 12 because then I'm picking, I'm picking Bueller second. Yeah. So for you, it's more about, that second round pitcher not getting pushed to the back of the order and being mm -hmm. in the six or seven to 10 range among starting pitchers as you build out the rotation, which again, that comes back to your preference of wanting to have one 
ace in the first two rounds. If you are the kind of player that says everyone's wrong about pitching this year, there will be aces that come from the round four to seven range that might change your thinking too. It's defensible, man. You Mm -hmm. know, like, you know, pitching, there's gonna be more injuries than the usual year. Uh, There's gonna be fewer innings than the usual year. Um, I think that there are people, uh, you know, claiming that some of these pitchers are going to be innings horses and some are not that uh, I I think we have less of a real idea of what uh, is going to happen there. I think that one of the knocks against Bueller is, you know, there's not going to be innings there. I don't know that. I mean, if I had a choice between starting Bueller and Gonsolin in a game, I'd start Bueller. So you know, I, I think if he's healthy, he's out there. So uh, yeah, there might be some health issues, but it doesn't show up in terms of arms and stuff. It's mostly been blisters. So, uh, but then there is the the TJ he had uh, in the minor leagues, which I don't know how relevant that is. Anyway, uh, a lot of shrug emoji there on terms of innings, and so I tend to gravitate towards talent with an idea of injury risk. Hopefully that's a helpful assessment of what you can do with your KDS, whether you're playing in TGFBI, playing in the NFBC, or implementing that into your home league for the first time this season. Again, highly recommended. For a certain kind of sports fan, the most important part of a game isn't always who wins and loses. Whether you're sweating out a late field goal to hit the over or watching nervously as a three-pointer in garbage time makes or breaks your four-leg parlay, having skin in the game completely transforms the fan experience. And that's why The Athletic is excited to announce the launch of its exclusive U.S. partnership with BetMGM and its new sports betting hub. Sports betting coverage at The Athletic will deliver all the insights, analysis, and original reporting subscribers have come to expect, plus fully integrated live odds and special offers from BetMGM. So even though Super Bowl 55 is now behind us, there's plenty of great action out there, whether you're talking NBA, NHL, college basketball, golf, and soon enough MLB. We've got MLB futures up already. Brandon Woodruff, plus 2,500 to win the NL Cy Young. How about Zach Gallon at plus 5,000? It's a pretty nice long odds opportunity there. Right now, BetMGM is offering Rates and Barrels listeners a risk-free first bet up to $600. Just sign up at BetMGM.com and use the bonus code RATES to take advantage of this special offer from the king of sportsbooks. This offer is for new customers. It's a risk-free first bet up to $600 at BetMGM.com with the bonus code RATES. Visit BetMGM.com for terms and conditions. Must be 21 years of age or older to wager. Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia only. Excludes Michigan disassociated persons. Please gamble responsibly. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, Nevada, and Virginia. 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help in Michigan. 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. In Tennessee, call or text the red line at 800-889-9789. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. Promotional offer not available in Nevada. All right, let's get to it. Let's get to our next question. This is a keeper strategy question, and it's an anonymous question because this particular person thinks people in his or her league will be listening. So I'm about to embark on a first-year auction keeper startup draft. It's a 15-team standard 5 by 5 roto auction, 260 budget with nine keepers. This is the deepest league ever played in. I'm curious what you think would be the best strategy to build a long-time contender. It's not a dynasty league, but I feel like there's big enough value in establishing an affordable core. And like most auction leagues, a player's salary rises each year. The quirk with this league is that undrafted players, waiver pickups, have their keeper price tied to projections. For example, if Wander Franco goes undrafted but gets picked up in season, his keeper price is determined by projected auction value, not fab price. League only has four bench spots, drafting and carrying prospects, the hope of keeping them. On the cheap comes at a big cost, but picking them up in season doesn't net as much potential keeper value. So, how would you how would you approach a startup in a league like this? I mean, this to me this is kind of like a dynasty question too. It's a very broad sort of concept. Uh, Not being able to stash prospects cheaply like that because of the small bench is a little bit of a factor. How do you work around that? Uh, I think you just want to buy heavily in the sort of 22 to 26 range, because I don't think that you, uh, uh, the, the choice often though, is like, do you just punt the first year? Uh, that could be a, a, a 
interesting strategy to consider where depending on how much money you invest in the league um, and how likely you think the league is to stick around uh, for those years where you would dominate because you in the first year didn't accrue a single point, finished last in the league and had 12 prospects in, in your lineup. Yeah. The, if there's no rules against it, that is a viable strategy that could lead to much dominance. But if you paid $500 to be in that league, it's a little bit rough. Yeah. I mean, I don't think you want to totally punt year one. And that was one of the things that was pointed out in this email as well. I think you do want to go just really young with the core. So we're talking in the first couple foundational pieces you're looking for players that are 25 and under you, know, you are trying to focus your big dollar buys on Acuna and Tatis and Soto's uh, maybe you could squeeze in Trey Turner for speed purposes but you you still want to skew young Kyle Tucker would be a good foundational piece in there and with players like that early if you spend up on those guys you've got a team core that can be competitive right away and maybe you don't win the first year but if you're mid level buys since this is an auction or your mid-round picks if we were doing the same kind of thing for a snake draft you know that's where it's important to go glaber torres for example instead of javi baez as you fill out a middle infield spot that's where it's important to go after uh, someone like keston hira or the younger guys that don't have the long track record instead of loading up with the 28 to 30 year old mashers who are nice players now but whose skills will tail off pretty quickly and whose trade value will actually tank relatively quickly. I would treat this league just like a dynasty league in terms of what I expect to get for players in the future. And once you take a hitter that doesn't run and push him past age 30, you get so much less than you should for that player in a trade that you know your foundation starts to fall apart and it's really hard to get the pieces you need to remain competitive in the long run. So I'd really emphasize keeping it young with your highest priced players and still keeping it in the mid twenties, like age 27, 28 players sort of as a cutoff in the mid rounds, but try to skew even younger than that as much as you can, as you build that foundation, knowing that, Hey, I'm not going to win this league necessarily in league one, but I'm not giving up in, in year one. Maybe my team's close enough. I make a couple trades that puts me over the top right away in the first season. Another thing I'll say is that I think you'll find that the elite prospects will be more expensive than you expect. Mm -hmm. And so if you have to spend that high to get a prospect, that you're not sure how much they'll play. And then you're keeping them at a price that, you know, that might be inflated. There's something I find in auto new a lot, you know, there'll be a shiny new toy and he'll be bid up as a prospect up to $10. Well, that puts a lot of pressure on him when he is playing to be a $10 player right off the bat. And if he is, then there's, you know, in auto new in particular, the price will rise and he'll be quickly less useful to you than if you had bought him at $2. So I try to keep my prospects in auto new at sort of two to $5 and, uh, and not, and not go above that unless they're, you know, in the big leagues this year. And so if that is the case and Wander Franco like costs 15, 20 bucks in auction, like imagine that he's going to, if he costs 20 bucks in auction, you could get a 26 year old, you know, what's Kyle Tucker going to go for? Like 25, 25, and maybe 28. Yeah. Like, why not get the guy who's going to play for you and maybe win you year one and then worry about year two later. And, and, and Kyle Tucker's not even that old. He'd be part of your core. So I would say that one thing that might actually de be depressed, and this happens in trading cards and just generally that, that recency bias that we talk about, uh, even with major league players, I think it's even stronger with minor league and prospect type players that like once they've had a little taste of the big leagues and it didn't go quite as planned, then they're labeled a bust way too quickly. So those players, I think, become an opportunity for you to actually buy some quote unquote prospects or um, young players at a cheap price. And that's I'm just looking at, I did, I did a filter on fan grass for under 23. Um, the, this, these are guys that like, you know, might not have the same shine as they had before. Nico Horner might be an interesting guy to put on your bench. Uh, Vlad Guerrero, I think, you know, it depends on your league. There'll be somebody who's still totally in the tank and there'll be a league that says, nah, he's, he's a first baseman. He's no good. Keston Hira, you know, could be, have depressed value. I like, I'd like that you brought up Torres. I think that could be uh, an interesting uh, situation there. Joe Adele, 
Uh, if Joe Adele goes for three dollars and Wanda Franco goes for twenty, I'd take Joe Adele. Even though you know I have questions, I have the same questions about strikeout rate as everybody else. But you're still getting you know a top ten ish type guy, uh, and you're doing it for way cheaper. So. Um, I don't know if Jordan Alvarez will be uh, slightly depressed in, in price, uh, but uh, that's the kind of uh, group I'd be looking for is somebody that came up, Isaac Paredes. Uh, you know, I don't know that he's amazing, but uh, he'll be a dollar, you know, and he'll play this year. And so you'll get a, more information about him. Yeah, I would say like Paredes and Nico Horner are kind of more like your end game sort of considerations. But yeah, yeah I would guys. definitely say that like Glaber, I think Nick Senzel was someone I talked about as one of the more yes. underrated outfielders in the pool. I love Nick Senzel for a league like this because I don't think there's going to be a lot of helium on his auction price, but there's still a lot Young, of potential long-term not expensive. value. Yeah. Victor Robles qualifies here too. I know I'm always looking for a reason to talk about Victor <laughs> Robles, but if he hadn't spent Your any time Victor in the Robles. big leagues, he is my guy <laughs> at this point. If he hadn't spent a day in the big leagues yet, he would cost probably more than he'll cost having spent some time in the big leagues, despite the fact that one of those seasons was a 17 homer, 28 steal season. I don't care how blue the stat cast page was. He did that. That happened. Those are skills he owns. He's a center fielder. He will play a lot. He could still get a lot better. Like I will make this defense at least for one more year. Yeah. And I might be wrong again this year, and I'm going to come right back. I'm going to make that argument again next year unless he weighs like 40 pounds more than he did when he came up. He probably has more power than Leota Tavares, you know? Like, he, you know, he's uh, he seems like a credible bat. I, if he can get up to 85 WRC+, plus, 90 WRC+, plus, the defense still floats him. You know? He was a 92 WRC plus guy in 2019, which was his first full big league season. Like, it's not unthinkable to see him getting up right. to 105 110 with that defense he could lead off against some lefties maybe hit a little higher in the order than expected against righties look stranger things have happened but that's the player type that you're looking for the the previously hype prospects that have dipped a little bit that still have a good hold on playing time i think that describes robles as much as it describes senzel i can't figure out the glaber torres adp for the life of me, he seems undervalued in redraft. He seems a little undervalued in keeper and dynasty right now, too. He's going to be a very good big league player for a long time. So he absolutely fits. Uh, would you say Austin Meadows fits in this group, too, as a guy that everyone loved Getting a year a ago? Bit, a little bit closer up in age, but still in that good age range. I did a reverse war sort, sort to find the worst. There's Joe Adele, number one. Youch. Uh, but I, I, I Hey, you good dollar pick. Robles is right there. Jesus Sanchez uh, knocking on the door. Abraham Toro. Uh, <laughs> we it? love him so much. We, we chose him twice. <laughs> uh, Brandon Rogers. Um, you know, a good depend, one too. It depends a little bit on the deep the depth of your league. Austin Riley, I think, would be a fun one. He's going to yep. actually play. Um, and, um, and, and he may not cost that much. Josh Naylor didn't have an amazing uh, debut those Luis Urias those are that's the kind of the where the shine is just a little bit off that's those and 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 absolutely uh you know not don't bid these guys up big because I said them you know what I mean no, like, no, no. the point is that these guys are good because they should be cheap and right. if you got if you got sort of three to five if you made your bench these guys three to five of these guys as your bench um, I think that might be more effective than loading up your bench with prospects, depending on the price. Cause you'll see, you'll see quickly, see what Wanda Franco goes for, and then you'll know what the top prospects will go for. So this kind of dovetails into an auction strategy question. And we talked about this a lot on the beat the shift podcast that I did with Ariel Cohen and, and Ruvain guy last week. But when you're nominating a player in an auction, choose a player for a reason. Throw Wander early because you want to know what he costs. You want to know if you have him or not. You want to know what that type of player is going to cost. If Wander goes for less than you think he should go for, throw more players like Wander. Build the ultra young core. Load up and and yeah, maybe you will punt the season. Punt like, that first year, maybe. Yeah, you know? like, like base, if Wander like, comes to you for seven bucks, then yeah, to just get a bunch of prospects and let everybody else win the first year, and you win a bunch of other years. Yeah, you're gonna have Vaughn and Torkelson and Wit and you know all those players. Like if if Wander goes that cheap, then you know like that's the path you can go down. If Wander gets a little too expensive, then you know all right, I'm probably not going to get quite as many of those guys as I thought, but let's go with the guys that we just discussed as, as that strategy and said. I mean, decision trees are 
kind of at the forefront of what we do on draft day. I think this is absolutely a spot where you can have at least an A versus B plan that a handful of early players sort of steer you one way or the other. So uh, it's a great question. Thank you for writing in. Let's get to our next question. I think this one came from Aaron. Uh, Starting a dynasty startup soon with an open universe player pool, 15 teams, 15 minor league slots, which expand by five slots for season two. Who are some top 200 level future draftees, international prospects, and players from overseas I should look to prioritize? Thanks in advance as a fellow Wisconsinite. Stay warm, DVR. All right. Um, Who do you like? as future draftees and international prospects. There are some leagues out there with open player pools that really get crazy. Uh, like Kumar Rocker and Jack Leiter are already on rosters in the XFL league that I'm in. Yeah. I know for you and Devil's Rejects, right? That's an open player oh my God. pool too. I've got the first round open. So we it's 20 teams. We keep 28 players and you can have anybody. And there's always, there's like the three perpetual rebuilders. And there's like, you know, three to five who, uh, temporary rebuilders. So there's teams that are almost all prospects. So uh, these are the prospects. The number one pick um, to Matt Eddy at Baseball America was Austin Wells uh, of the New York Yankees. Um, and then we got some Aaron Shunk action, number two, uh, but and also Jung Hoo Lee from Korea. Uh, Khalil Watson must be a college player. <laughs> mm-hmm. Must be. Clue. He doesn't know who that is. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we've got um, Luis, Luis, Rod- Luis Rodriguez, who it looks like he's affiliated in the Dodgers. Um, Alexander Canario, uh, the San Francisco outfielder. Uh, went in the first round then Josh Baez and Isaiah Thomas were unaffiliated Um, you know that's super deep I in fact the I I almost take issue with the question I don't think you have to go that deep what did he say it was like a 15 team uh, a a 15 team with 15 keepers 15 minor slots that's just it's dynasty too so you have your big league roster plus 15 more in the minors and it becomes 20 in season two so that gets pretty deep and if you're not if you're not looking deep. at those players that are either going to sign as future J2 players or players in college or great high school players that are projected to be early first rounds. If you're not a year ahead on those players, you do miss out on some really good, talented players. Uh, one guy playing in Japan who I think is really interesting is Seiya Suzuki. The reason I think he's interesting is because Tim McLeod, who I think is as in deep with Japanese and Korean league players as anybody I know, He's got him stashed away already in our XFL keeper league, right? And you look into Suzuki's profile and you see a player that you know, has power, has speed, hits for a really high average. If and when he comes over, if he's posted and comes to the States, he's the kind of player that becomes an impact player right away. I think Sagano will come over eventually too, the, the, the pitcher. Um, and, and that was going to come over this year. He, he has like one-year deals, basically, one-year option type deals. So I think he'll, uh, and now that he's a free agent, I think he can come over without the posting money. Um, he might be able to just come over um, on his own regard and, and maybe without the posting money, it's a little bit easier of a situation for him. So um, I, I could see Sagano coming over next year. And I think he could actually absolutely have Masahiro Tanaka type uh, impact. He's the same kind of guy where he'll double up, triple up, quadruple up the slider, just like Tanaka has good slider command, has a good splitter, uh, had slightly more velocity than Tanaka. So uh, there's always the, uh, and there's always the chance that he has a better fit with a home park. Uh, you know, if Tanaka had been a San Francisco giant. He would have put up three, three ERAs for the life of his, his career. I'm pretty sure of it. So, um, you know, I think Sagano is someone worth stashing as well. If you're looking for some insight for the 2021 MLB draft, one of the best early resources that I know about is actually the fan prospect board, because there's a special tab for the upcoming draft, not surprisingly, Jack Leiter, Kumar Rocker, one and two on there. Khalil Watson, who you just mentioned, you know, is fourth on Eric Longenhagen's rankings there. You get future values of those players. Uh, you actually get scouting reports on there. There's a risk component on there as well. Eric does great work, so I highly recommend checking that out. If Jack you're more Leiter, dude. He looks real Jack good Leiter. on the Pitching Ninja they, Clips. I didn't watch the game, said- but I saw some highlights that looked real good. 
they said the gun was a little hot. So I don't <laughs> think it looked like for a second he was sitting 98. And I was just like, what? Uh, I think maybe he was sitting 95 or 96. Uh, Eric was doing some tweets during that game. But I think if he's sitting 95, that hook looks really legit. Um, and uh, so Jack Leiter was, uh, was really interesting. To have him and Kumar Rocker at the top, I feel like Vanderbilt has to be. Um, uh, and... And says the nerd, they have a great pitching lab. <laughs> they have a pitching lab that's probably better than all but maybe two or three major league pitching labs in terms of uh, data, tech, and uh, uh, people power uh, there. So it all checks out. That's why they keep churning out great major league pitchers at Vandy. Uh, thanks a lot for that question, Aaron. That's a really fun way to play open universe player pools. Uh, I think create a few more strategies. Draft packs. yourself. <laughs> Bet on yourself. <laughs> Hi, I'm a 44 year old left handed hitting first baseman <laughs> on my softball team. Imagine but, trying to sell him in a, in, you're selling yourself in a deal. <laughs> you I might even make get, the bigs. <laughs> you wouldn't even get the Ball last ceiling. reserve pick back for yourself. That's the. <laughs> The most humbling thing. About I do that. actually own myself in. Uh, uh, we have. Uh, we I think we opened up ours um, and uh, in my longtime home one, but we only have ten slots in the minors, and it's a twelve-team league. Uh, so I am cutting myself this year. <laughs> Dropping himself back into the pool. I wonder if anybody else will use one of those ten <laughs> precious spots to uh, to stash you away. He tops out at seventy. With His movement. average exit velocity How's the is stuff around number? 55. Yeah. Terrible hips. Real low. <laughs> Terrible hips. Terrible pelvis. <laughs> I would love it if someone wrote the full scouting report on oh, you God. and it just started with terrible pelvis. Like <laughs> <laughs> no scouting report oh, has God. ever started with those words. <laughs> <laughs> Introducing a far superior product to today's CBD marketplace, the Eagle Moon Hemp Consumer Line. Grown, harvested, extracted, and produced all in the United States. All Eagle Moon Hemp products are vegan, low sugar, use organic practices, and made from award-winning crop. And just in case you didn't know, CBD is not marijuana. It does not get you high. CBD may help to relieve pain, nausea, seizures, anxiety, and depression. Get 30% off all CBD products site-wide at eaglemoonhemp.com with the promo code ATHLETIC. Their products are pure, proven, lab-tested, and superior to other CBD on the market. And the best part is they're way less in price. Throw in that discount code and you're practically getting a product for free. That's eaglemoonhemp.com with the promo code ATHLETIC. Try them out while winning free products. You can just go to their Facebook page and leave a review or follow them on Instagram. A winner is chosen each week and sent a free product. Check them out. And let us know how you like them. That's eaglemoonhemp.com, promo code ATHLETIC. I did. I did. And uh, without, you know, uh, saying that it will necessarily work for everyone, it's it's been a good one for me. You know, it's a Tuesday nights for me are a little bit tough because I run Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday nights. Sometimes I don't sleep that well. Um, and I've been using their CBD product on Tuesday nights recently. And it's, it's, it's worked for me. I, I don't, I look bright and fresh faced today. <laughs> don't answer gotta, that. We need to fix your lighting, <laughs> sir. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's, it's nice when, when our sponsors can help us out because I think this next one can actually help me out. Is your Wi-Fi struggling to keep you with your, keep up <laughs> with your streaming at work, gaming, video calling, and more about doing all those things at once? Because maybe, like me, you're hosting a podcast and your spouse is finishing her dissertation and there just isn't enough bandwidth to run data and talk to Eno at the same time. Just isn't enough bandwidth mm. for that. When you're connected to your world by Wi-Fi, be sure it's the best. Bring your Wi-Fi up to speed with Orbi Wi-Fi 6 from Netgear. Orbi Wi-Fi 6 is the best and latest in Wi-Fi. It covers your entire home with unmatched speeds and performance for uninterrupted working and learning, video calling, and streaming at home on more devices than ever before in any part of the house. With Wi-Fi this advanced, you're going to want it everywhere. Ready for the best Wi-Fi ever? Find out what makes Netgear America's number one choice for Wi-Fi at netgear.com slash best Wi-Fi. That's netgear.com slash best Wi-Fi. All right, more questions to get to as we roll through this episode. This is another auction keeper question. This one comes from Tom. I have a ton of money to spend at the draft, and I don't think I can compete this year because the other teams already have so much value. Can you offer some specific suggestions other than the obvious 
buy young players or I should be spending my money. 80% of high-ranking players will already be kept. This is a frustrating problem to have. This begins to happen over time when inflation in a keeper league gets a little out of hand, right? You end up with a lot of money left. The teams that have great keepers have everything they need. There's not really a lot of places to spend the money. I think the best play, when I've run into this situation, you know, the move I find that works the best, go ahead and buy one or two of those great players, even though there aren't many left. You got the money to afford it. Throw a good chunk of that money at whatever player is available, knowing that there should be, unless there are some really tight in-season caps, there should be a path to trade those players to somebody who is going to possibly win the league this season, because at least doing that, you're getting a path to some younger players that aren't available in the auction. You're buying that other will teams. Help you later. Yeah. You're buying other teams, young players, you're buying potential prospects, potential young players uh, in the future. Yeah. I would absolutely say that uh, it, it depends like in auto new, um, you know, there's a little bit more pressure uh, if they're, if you spend a lot for that player. So like if you, uh, buy someone, you have to fit it into your 400 a cap or you have to give them a loan. You'll still get some value if it's a rental, but you get a lot less value than if you bought at a reasonable price. So I don't know how that, that machination works in your league. So it's possible that you may want to just look for the most reasonable uh, veterans at the, you know, like that, that you'd still bring you some trade value. You have to buy some veterans. You can't spend all your money. Uh, otherwise you just bid up uh, to the prospects too much and they'll just be too expensive for you in the future as well. So, you know, like there's definitely some uh, something there to buying a veteran, uh, whether or not you just go all the way in and buy the best buy Steven Strasburg uh, for $50 because uh, you'll trade him as a rental. Um, or if it's more like, make sure you only get Steven Strasburg for 22 because then he has more trade value. There's, there's a fine line there. I don't know exactly. That's something you have to figure out with your league, but I absolutely agree that you're just going to have to buy some veterans. Pretend you're going to win this year. I think that is actually uh, something that's worth thinking about in a lot of leagues is sort of pretend you're going to win this year. Even if you don't think you're going to win, pretend you're going to win, build for that, and then trade off all the pieces. It's a little bit like the A's Diamondbacks model, you know, where you just build a team that's going to be okay. If it's not okay, trade away everything that's not nailed down and, and build. In Autonew, for example, the draft is overrated. The draft is kind of crappy. And that's what I'm hearing here in this situation. He's saying, I have a bunch of money, but I think the draft is going to be crappy. The draft is crappy in auto new. So you have to do a lot of your building in August and July, you know, in a normal season last year, that would be like the beginning of the season, <laughs> but like, you know, it, you have to do your building in season. So what I end up doing in auto new is I don't have a lot of money when the draft comes around uh, because I've already sort of done all my rebuilding. I did a big trades. I did a bunch of big trades in August uh, when other teams were trying to win. And I don't necessarily think that a bunch of bounce back, a lot of times there's this too. I told you that Jeff Zimmerman said that like bounce back veterans, bounce back projections over 33, that they're not reliable. That's what's in the market a lot of times at auto new in the, in the draft, right? It's like, Ooh, who wants to buy a, you know, who wants to spend $60 on a 34 year old JD Martinez? You know, yeah, no one that's wants not going to gonna that. be a foundational piece for your team. You know, that's going to be either, you know, money you get back later or a rental for somebody else. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a line there to walk between uh, getting a reasonable price or just buying some veterans that you think will, will uh, you'll be able to sell later. Yeah. But I think the key here, like if everybody who's contending right now is worried about high quality innings and, or speed, find the handful of players that, offer that in the auction spend there because those are your best short-term trade ships. And I think like, you know, said, you know, you don't have to let the league, hopefully you haven't let the league know that you're playing for 2022 and it might look like you're trying for this year. And you know, that might help you in terms of leverage that you'll have when you do trade those players at some point, hopefully in the yeah, crowd, the market out the for saves and steals, man, saves and steals. They always have currency. You know? Mm-hmm. Hopefully that helps you out, Tom. Uh, next question here comes from Steve. I have a question in regards to a keeper league. I'm in it's a head-to-head -head league, and the scoring is five by five with OPS taking the place of batting average. Unfortunately, I'm only allowed to keep one of Juan Soto or Fernando Tatis Jr. based on their current ADP. I've been trying to decide which player would be more beneficial to keep over the long term, but I'm stuck because I can make a case for both players. Who, in your eyes, has the most value? as a first round keeper 
over the long term. Keep up the great work, Steve. Yeah, this is um, this is a good problem to have. And I mm. imagine in this setup, it doesn't sound like you can trade one because if you could do that, you would just do that. And then you'd still right. have to decide, well, who am I trading away? Uh, but if you had to choose between these two, be that as a keeper cutoff or you start up, whatever your situation is, you know, thinking about their long-term futures, how do you decide? God darn. I would say that um, Tatis is the safest real life overall player, young player that there is because he's a five tooler. And so even with the strikeout rate being a tiny bit of whiff of risk um, and maybe the injury, he's a five tooler. So he can give you, he can give you value everywhere. And, and he's a, he's a plus defender. So he's at short. Soto doesn't have that going for him in terms of speed and he doesn't have positional value for you in the corner outfield. Um, and so he could end up being a first baseman pretty soon, maybe a DH. I don't know when that ends up. I think he's, he's, he's pretty good defensively, but um, I don't think he's, he's not, you know, a center fielder. So he's get, he's the next rung for him is first base. Um, however, I think Soto has the, the safest bat in, in the big leagues. I mean, just the, the way that he combines patience and power is uh, just utterly ridiculous, really. And so that's what makes it so hard is you have the safest sort of overall player versus the safest bat. And I don't know if I put it that way to you, does that does it make it clearer to you? I'm, I'm not sure it does to me, but it, that's sort of how I see it. Yeah, I. <laughs> it's tough because if you feel like you're going to win right now, and steals are important to you and you throw Tatis back Tatis, yeah. where are you getting those bags from it depends how many other keepers you have that being said if I'm thinking about the long game and who I want to have on my team for five years or 10 years or however long you could end up keeping one of these guys it might be Soto. it's Soto like it is Soto for all the reasons you mentioned Soto's a better hitter and that's not a knock on Tatis at all Soto is maybe the best hitter I've ever seen he could be better than Pujols he could be better than you know Pete Miguel yeah. Cabrera right he could be that kind of guy I think he, the, like it's not even he can be like he already like you know what I mean like he's doing he's, it like and yeah if you imagine like what would I mean and Soto runs a little more than people give him credit for too so you're not getting a zero in steals how long that lasts is probably a worthy question to ask but there's a question related to Tatis that we're going to get to in just a minute that raises that point like he runs now but how long is he really going to run for is he going to be the kind of guy that in his late 20s is down to five to ten bags yeah, probably. That's what most star players do. Uh, I would choose Soto in this situation. If I'm thinking about multi-year keeper value, even though I like Tatis more based on how 2021 shapes up and the player I think he is now, that's all about speed. You have a case for 2021 only to choose Soto. And if you're thinking about the long term, he is the safer player. Even though Tatis just got the 14-year extension, Juan Soto probably is the safest player in the entire pool. If you're trying to play long-term value and keeper dynasty startup making this decision like Steve Soto is the better way to go. And it's, and it's not like he's um, more like a Jordan Alvarez or somebody like a big slugger or whatever in terms of his skill set does actually bring something to the table. That's rare and unique and valued, which is a uh, high batting average along with mm -hmm. that, uh, that power. It's not like we're saying, Oh, this 260 hitter with great power and great patience is really safe. Uh, that that then I think I might go back to Tatis because then it's like well that package of skills is readily available so it might be super safe but how much do I really want a 260 hitter with 30 homers every year when I think I can probably find that on the open market pretty easily we're talking about a 300 hitter uh, who's going to be at the top of the lineup so he's just going to give you perennial runs in RBI and and just fill out the stat sheet because of his OBP as well um, so um. I think I think I go Soto, but uh, those those steals, man, and uh, and just being a shortstop where you know like he'll be a shortstop, and then some year he'll be a shortstop and third baseman or second baseman. You'll have all these like options. I feel like that are interesting. But the 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 last little kicker is you know I wrote an article about Tatis's risk being encapsulated by his injuries. I'm not saying he's injury prone, but I am saying that like on the list of comps, there's Mike Trout, Alex Rodriguez, uh, you know, Acuna, a lot of players that uh, seem like rock solid rock uh, locks for, you know, 
uh, Extended Glory. And then there was also Bob Horner, uh, Carlos Correa. Um, I forget the third one, but guys who get injured, who got injured more and who sh shone, bro sh shone bright when they were in, uh, but had trouble staying in. So there is that uh, possibility for Tatis that I don't think Soto has shown yet. Yeah, and I'm looking at our, our friend Ian Khan has updated dynasty rankings on the athletic. Our draft kit launched today. Draft kit, baby. So Ian went ahead and he he did something that James Anderson actually put out back in the spring over at Rotowire. He had rebuilding rankings in addition to the regular dynasty rankings. Uh, Ian went ahead and made both lists as part of our draft kit. Juan Soto is at the top of both the win now and the rebuilding list. So maybe that gives you some extra confidence in that decision. Uh, it's interesting, though, because we got another question about Tatis from uh, a player that is basically asking, is this the peak in Tatis's value? And in some ways, it's kind of like there's not really a, a lot more he can do. I mean, he's if he's three on a dynasty set of rankings uh, now, he's not going to get to one unless Soto and Acuna are both clearly a little notch below him, right? I mean, I like, disagree. I disagree. I think if, you know, he's projected right now, basically to have a 30, like maybe a 40, 30 season, which is crazy. So There's I think if he went 280, 40, 30, that would, he hasn't it. really done that because, and it's not one of it's not his fault. Like 2020, it's not his fault that he didn't get a full season. Right. And if you, if you pace out 2020, uh, you're getting pretty close to 40, 40, 30. Right. Um, so I, I think if he just did it, uh, for a full season and you got a 280, 40, you know, even 25 season from him, he, you know, new rankings would have him top. Yeah. So, and you would have had that season of value, right? Like who are you trading him for? <laughs> Is that too? It's like, yes, he's at his peak value, but who are you trading for? Do you really want to trade him for like five guys who may end up being second rounders? <laughs> You know what right. I mean? When you could take the number, keep the number one overall guy and have, you know, number one through three overall guy for the next five years. I think I'd rather try and find those guys who will pop and keep the number one guy. It's almost it doesn't usually work out to trade. a, a Yeah. It's almost impossible to get value for a player like this. Way. That's like what you, I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're just, you're just never going to get that like, offer. Being super excited to get, yeah, what what, am I, what what would I be excited to get for Tatis? It would have to be like, oh man, and and he's he's not he's not trying to uh, win now, right? Like I could see a, a win now package for Tatis, but it would be ridiculous. It would be like Yelich, Cole, you know, what I mean? right? <laughs> like, yeah, if you're going all right? in for right now, and you you've got Tatis, and you want to go over the top to make sure you win and still have a chance to win you, maybe the next like year Yelich, or two. Maybe I'll stand back the pitcher a little bit. Yelich Bauer, you know, it'd be like Yelich Bauer and, uh, you know, I'm throwing another, I'm throwing another, I'd throw in another bat. Uh, Bright, yeah, somebody, somebody that has a little bit of youth to him, right? And uh, and then you're like, okay, I'm gonna win, I'm gonna win this year because I'm getting all this huge package. But if you're rebuilding, what do you <laughs> like? Well, I don't know, I don't know what you want. I don't know, I don't know what you'd get. I mean, even a package that was like. Torkelson, Franco. Uh, well, there's, there's an example. So in this particular league, this is from Jonathan. Hira. He's, in, he's in a six-team league. It's a small league, but they have deep rosters to offset uh -huh. how small the league is. And he, he's kind of in the, my team doesn't have as much star power as the others. So he's trying to turn Tatis into multiple stars in this case, which is right, a pretty right. unique situation. So he's trying to get Vlad Jr., Adley Rutschman, Marco Luciano, and the first pick in the draft, which would likely be Spencer Torkelson. I don't think that's enough. I, I don't think as great as Marco Luciano could be, there's still some ways where he could just be a good early rounder and not a superstar. Rutschman as a catcher brings extra risk. I mean, even if he's a top five catcher, look where the top five catchers end up production wise compared to the rest of the pool. Yeah, They're fringy top 100 hitters. Aren't really valuable to me. And Torkelson... Is Torkelson like a surefire future first round fantasy guy for you? Because he's not for me. I think a typical good middle of the order run producer at first base, where I think he's eventually going to end up, settles in more like round three, round four, if it all clicks. Like think of Jose Abreu, where he's going right now. And Abreu is obviously a lot older than to, Pete Torkelson, but I don't know. You'd have, like to I, bet on the, you'd have to bet on the switch to third, I guess. That's got to happen 
Luciano's got to be a star, and as great as Vlad Jr. could be, I'm not doing it there. Hit his upper reaches too, especially now that he's a first baseman. You might do that trade, come up with a, a prospect bust and uh, two middle round first basemen, and that would be a terrible outcome. Yeah, and I think looking forward, other prospects already on Jonathan's roster. He's got Wander, he's got Kelnick, he's got Cabrian Hayes, Dylan Carlson, no. C.J. Abrams. Like that Just core is almost ready. Wait for the cavalry. Yeah. Wait for the cavalry. Tatis is your star, and one of those guys will be a star. Wait for the cavalry. Don't, don't, don't jump the gun. That's all I'm saying. So yeah, I, I don't would, think I would sit tight. I don't think there's anything wrong with thinking like this. No, you think it through. But if that's if that's like the offer that you kind of come to, I think. You say, no, thanks, and let me see what Jared Kellens can do, baby. Let me see what Wander Franco can do. Come on, one of those guys can be a star next to Tatis. I mean, I think you go into this believing Tatis is like a like a Betts Trout type player where three, four, five years from now, he's still firmly in the first round. That's a big part of why you're standing pat here, in addition yeah. to having those reinforcements. Now, if you want to move Cattell Marte to the highest bidder in your league right now, sure, in a, in a shallow league like that, He's a guy that we've probably seen his best season from. Problem is, he just had his worst, worst possible season, season yeah. in the shortened season. So it's probably a hold for now. Trade him if he looks like he's 2019. Could tell Marte again. Keep Glaber in that situation. He's got Glaber on that roster. You know, Burns, Paddock. He's even got a couple of young pitchers that could jump up a level over the course of patience, the season. A little well. bit of patience here, I think. I yep. think that's the ticket. You're in a hold situation here, Jonathan. I think you got a really good core that you put around Tatis. I've got a Fangraphs calculator question from Matt. He's messing around with the Fangraphs auction calculator in some pre-draft prep. How do you order your positional priority when preparing for a draft on the auction calculator? The preset, catcher, shortstop, second base, third base, outfield, first base, doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Also, should the positional priority be different in a roto versus point system? In this case, Matt's using CBS's base point system. So... What do you do with your positional presets when you run the auction calculator at Fangraphs, you know? Hmm. I, uh, for the most part, ignore it because uh, catcher's at the top and uh, catcher is just either something I ignore if it's a one catcher situation or something I have a strategy for if it's a two catcher situation. Um, and I don't necessarily always just take the number it spits out for catcher as gospel. Um, I also don't think that that positional priority um, uh, is has a huge effect. He, correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, he's he's the one kind of looking at this. I don't think it has a huge effect. Uh, but if I were to put anybody at the top of it, um, personally, I'd put like second base uh, at the top, and I might put first second. I think I'm going first base after catcher i think i'm going second catcher first shortstop third outfield is probably my current priority i also there's so many outfielders you know i don't think it makes a huge difference how you do it because if something just looks off and you're looking at those rankings and you're like you know what i'm just i'm not taking this player this early this is what i do with catchers currently i deflate them on my own i just pass i skip them and come back to it later Uh, but if that's why mock drafts are, are very useful i mean i'm doing these mock drafts and i'm like you know, I have to, even with my pitcher ranks, I have to now make the decision. You know, it's not, I can debate it in the, in the theoretical realm with my spreadsheet in front of me, but then when you're in a draft and you have some more skin in the game, you know, like I took Gallon over Maeda. I think I that's probably Maeda right. Gallen. I mean, uh, it, I, so I, you know, maybe the next update, on, it's only one switch. It's not that big a deal. And that's why I think you, when you're looking at rankings or projected auction value, I know there's people out there who say, the, the value is the value. Uh, well, what projection do you use? Do you do this projection? Do you do this projection? What, what priority? Do you, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, there's, mm-hmm. so, there's so much like that you could alter the, to say that it just spits out one number and that is, you know, God's given number for that player. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. I don't know. It doesn't make much sense to me. <laughs> also then given there, there's error bars on every projection. And you know, <laughs> you know, I, I like it better as uh, a general guide. Yeah, I, I do too. And I, I don't think I would change the position priority ranks for the points league versus a roto league. I think I would leave it the same, no matter the format that I was running it for. I mean, the position shapes are generally what they are. I realize like 
points leagues can be wildly different. I think if I remember correctly, the CPS default point scoring system doesn't diverge that far away from rotisserie values. So I don't think you have to make any sort of uh, tweaks in that case, but a great question and a great tool. And we've talked about it a lot. The Fangraphs auction calculator is great because you can put a lot of custom settings in there, choose the projection system you want and kind of play with it until you kind of come up with something that fits the league that you're playing in. Growing up, cereal was one of the best parts of being a kid, but I had to give it up because I realized it was full of sugar and junk that I really shouldn't eat. Magic Spoon has released a brand new variety pack now featuring peanut butter. Peanut butter has gotten so much love, they've decided to keep it permanent and add it to the best sellers variety pack, which also includes frosted, fruity, and cocoa. Zero sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, four net grams of carbs, and 140 calories in each serving. It's keto-free, keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. Fruity is my favorite flavor in that variety pack, by the way. It's a great healthy snack. Go to magicspoon.com slash rates to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code rates at checkout to save $5 off your order. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Remember to get your next delicious bowl of guilt free cereal at magicspoon.com slash rates and use the code rates to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. All right, you know, there was a big thread that emerged on Twitter after our reliever episode that went up on Monday. Yesterday was one of those days I wasn't on Twitter very long. And when I opened it up at eight o'clock at night, it just looked like I got pulled into uh, the dust cloud bar fight. I was like, whoa, hey, what's going on in here? It actually wasn't that bad. It was just a really long string of tweets. I think there were a lot of responses, a lot of surprise that there are only, you know, a number of closers you could count on one hand that you truly trust this season. Uh, one question that came in was just, when are you guys in the fantasy industry going to say enough's enough with saves? Let's go ahead and do something. Saves plus hold, make up a new stat, get rid of it, do something. And I think we are a little closer to that now than we were a year ago. I think as teams continue to push down the path of maybe going with more committees, we might have to make some kind of change to better account for how relievers are used and how relievers are valued in our game. Yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, on one hand, I'm I'm definitely someone who's into like just tell me the rules and I'll try to win. Um, but uh, on the other hand, it's just getting excruciating. Wins and saves, in particular, are just uh, just being disseminated Mike Shanahan style to you know you know all of the different arms uh, on the roster in such a just an aggravating style that it's uh, it's hard to pin them down. It was already hard enough to project. Was, I think wins and saves are probably the two hardest things to project anyway, uh, because A, they come on pitchers and pitchers are hard to project. And then B, uh, they're so role specific and team specific. It's uh, there's all this sort of team context uh, involved in all of those um, that uh, they do. It does make them infuriating. Um, and there isn't a lot of science uh, to the projection of uh, wins and saves is just the uh, one thing I've seen. Like, you know, we can say the role is important uh, going forward for, for saves. So like the eighth inning person usually takes over for the ninth inning person when there's that sort of uh, when there's an in season change, uh, but role hasn't necessarily doesn't have like a projection quality to it necessarily. You can't just look at uh, either, you know, the effect of previous closer experience is, uh, less than uh, other things like strikeout rate and velocity, uh, just according to the numbers of research that's been out there. Um, so, but, you know, role is super, exp super important. It's like wins. It's like, you know, you'll have one guy on a team, same team, um, you know, with similar numbers to another guy. And one guy has 14 wins and one guy has nine. And that's meaningful in fantasy, you know, to, it's not that meaningful for actually ex understanding the true talent of those two players. Right, right. right. It's like, you know, is Devin Williams worse than Brad Hand? Uh, because Brad Hand got, you know, 24 saves last year? No, no. <laughs> right, right. It, I don't think so. It's just one of those areas where fantasy diverges so far away from real life value, it gets a little frustrating. And look, there's a big difference between five by five and how the game's been played for years, for decades. But 
mm-hmm. I've always accepted that as just part of what fantasy baseball is. And I, I know with linear weights leagues, some of the stuff that auto new does, there are a lot of new ways to play that give you something much closer to a, a true simulation, or you can play score sheet leagues, right? You can play other types of Sims that, that are looking more closely at actual results than how you get there. Of course, is going to have to follow the same lines of thinking that big league teams follow, but this sort of frustration is common. We got an email from, from Daniel. He writes, I wanted to throw something counterintuitive out there and get your thoughts. So here it is for ranking closers, rate stats do not matter aside from their impact on a closer being able to keep his job. The statistical argument is simple. Relief pitchers throw so few innings that huge ERA differences don't actually impact your team ERA appreciably over the course of a season. An example, closer A puts up a 250 ERA, one whip, and a 14K9. Closer B puts up a four ERA, 130 whip, and a 10K for nine. These guys seem miles apart, and these projections would likely put their ADPs 100 picks apart or more, but applied to 60 innings pitched. The difference between these two players is only 10 earned runs, 18 hits and walks, and 27 Ks. I would think that projected job security should be given a much higher weight in ranking closers than any of their rate stats. I know that elite rate stats and high job security often go hand in hand, but a nice example of this analysis could be applied to Josh Hader versus a role as Chapman, where Hader might have a slight edge on Chapman and rate stats. Hader might also be used in his more typical fireman role and only collect 20 saves versus 30 or 40 for Chapman. So shouldn't Chapman be the obvious pick here? You know, likewise, should we give higher weight to crappy closers without much competition for the job, right? That section that we really didn't like, a lot of those toss-up guys, he included Hunter Harvey, Colome, Rafael Montero, Leclerc, Rodriguez, Joaquin Soria, compared to the elite but volatile situations from Edwin Diaz, who I think the Mets came out and said doesn't have a closer tag yet, James Karinchak, and Craig Kimbrell. So to a degree, I agree with this because I think we – probably do overestimate examples at the top possibly right. the yeah. math example that's laid out by daniel i think is pretty compelling and i think although i would say account for that 30 k's like look at your standings last year <laughs> like, yeah 30 k's is not nothing 30 k's probably got you a point or two in the standings yeah and i mean it's it's less than the impact of those five wins that you referenced earlier like five wins mm-hmm. might le- legitimately be five standings points in leagues so it could be mm-hmm. one point per win because they get clustered up so much K's, yeah, maybe one, two points in some cases, possibly a little more in others. I I generally agree, though, with the idea that this is the one position, the only position where rollover skills is the way I lean right now. And I hate playing that way. I hate that because the mantra, we talked about the old Chandler mantra, draft skills, not rolls, that usually applies. In the bullpen especially, it's all about the roll. And predicting that is so incredibly difficult. Um, I, I think you will find when you look back at winning teams, plenty of winning teams end up having the like one or two late closers that hit the ugly closers. Nobody else wanted. Right. And I don't even know if it's necessarily by design every time. Sometimes it's, well, I had to get someone for saves and I happened to pick the right one. I actually think it, it can be kind of fluky. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try. But I do think you find that with the variance in 50 or 60 innings anyway, some of those mediocre, poor skilled relievers come out and crank out 25, 30 save seasons with good ratios, even though their skills would never point you to a projection like that. Yeah, I mean, hand hand made it through last season. I didn't think he would. Uh, But like, read me back that that list of of examples, because like, I don't even think they're closers. Right. The the crappy closers without much competition. Hunter Harvey, Alex Colome, Rafael Montero. I think he he's definitely different than the other two. Montero, I could I could get I could dig with, yeah. Jose Leclerc doesn't necessarily have the job yet. Richard Rodriguez probably has the job and Joaquin Soria toss up with Crichton right now. I mean it's that type of pitcher though, right? Or you could throw Archie Bradley in that part of the conversation. You could Mm -hmm. throw uh, maybe Daniel Bard if Scott Oberg's not ready to start the season. If we're talking about the specifics, uh, I'm 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 with it on Rodriguez and Montero, um, maybe Bradley to some extent. Um, I could see it, but not all of those names, and I, I wouldn't make a blanket assumption. And uh, I still stick with my idea of uh, one stud, and um, although I will say, when the pedal hits the metal dollars to donuts 
I'm in this draft and hold uh, situation right now. I'm in this DC. I did not get Hater. I did not get Chapman. Some of it was, you know, draft position, the KDS conversation. Some of it was just like they were never. I would either have to totally push to get to get them, or they were never. But I did choose Jordan Alvarez over Rysel Iglesias, and that was my last chance to get a, sort of a top six closer. So um, I don't want to talk too much about the board. Uh, now I realize <laughs> we have listeners in this league. It's ah, going to be a little cares? while. Let's Hopefully your next turn comes up at least before uh, before this pod <laughs> before is this. available. <laughs> yeah. But um, uh, I do uh, generally like the idea of one stud and some oatmeals. Um, and I would say like, like Montero and Rodriguez and them are oatmeals. Um, but I may end up with a couple oatmeal because these are getting pushed up. I think these saves are getting pushed up and I just see so much volatility. Like, like people know that uh, for example, um, 40% of closers lose their job every year. Yeah. Like, how is that a good investment? Like, I'm not, I like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not digging on the, on the top on, on spending a lot on them. I want to get the cheapest stud. And if I can't get stud, I'll do two oatmeals and two or three uh, darts. Cause I do agree with you. Those darts, those darts get the outsized value. If you hit a late closer and, and I'll say that we have research that says that new closers have more velocity and more strikeout rate than the closers they replace. So what do, what do you do? You get two oatmeals that have good role. You get your Rafael Montero, you get your Richard Rodriguez, you get the guys who have role. Um, if you want to include uh, Saria, I guess, um, you know, to say that he has massive amounts of closing experience, it's like pretty far in his rearview mirror, but sure. He's closed before. If you want to, you know, you want to dig on Saria, then do it. But um, then you're going to take what I'm going to take are hard throwing guys behind bad behind Saria. You know what I mean? Like, like I'll take a Ginkle uh, really, really late. Um, I'll take uh, we we talked about this. We had the whole episode, but what I'm saying is I, I, I'll lean towards hard throwing strikeout guys uh, behind bad closers as my as my as my uh, darts but yeah in the oatmeal section sometimes it'll just be a guy who has the role looks okay projects okay is okay you know and for what it's worth uh i think that uh, my i was sort of maybe i was a little bit over exuberant about pomerantz i think pomerantz is going to have the deal but i think he's a little bit closer to uh to a dart throw than a um than an oatmeal I put him. I mean, he's, Pomerantz is definitely not oatmeal. No, no. He's either no. going to be really great closer, or he's not going to be the closer. But he's not oatmeal. Po but Pomerantz falls into the skills are good enough to use him if he's not closing. Not every failed closer has that. So that's why I think Pomerantz and, like and Taylor is, Rogers are Leclerc okay. is not going to be. Leclerc is not going to be useful. I don't think. If he's not if he's closing, not closer, he's probably struggling. And if he's not he's high, got six six walks for nine, and <laughs> right. you don't want him on your team. And he's had shoulder issues, so he's probably not going to be a high volume late inning reliever. So it's not like he's mm. going to be that max usage, high leverage guy who's always in there in a key spot. Well, you know, Pomerantz has shoulder down. issues. Yeah, I guess that's that's fair. But... <laughs> It's so anyway, I, I would just say I like Pomerantz, but he's a little bit closer to that dart section where uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't pencil him in. I would I would want to get him somewhere in the draft where uh, I'm getting these guys that I think will pop. But to Daniel's point, I think there is, again, ideally Iglesias Presley for me. But if I only get one of them, if I only get Presley because he's cheaper, I'm going to try and pick my spot somewhere around that Rafael Montero range and then take one more shot late knowing that Montero could lose the job because anyone can lose the job. My third dart might be an early cut and that last reliever, maybe I take a chance on late also could just be a ratios play or an early cut as well. It could be a spot you're chasing all season long. Having one established closer at least gives you something in that category. There will be teams that punt. There'll be some teams that fail. And as long as you're not one of those two teams, you'll get something. You'll get four or five or six standings points with one really good closer if you get someone in that top 10 who can hold on to the job all season long. So it's really important to me to at least and get one. One last thing is there may be a, a disconnect between uh, general uh, managers and general managers. There is actually literally a disconnect in Arizona between the general manager and the manager. I think there's been a documented difference of opinion about who should close between the manager and the general manager. Like, I think that the manager wants Crichton and the general manager wants Saria. So uh, I, I, 
I don't have a link for you. Uh, maybe I can look for one later, but that, that's something that sort of floated to the top. And I would say that I know from agents what like what people, what general managers are looking for with relievers. They don't care about role. They don't care about ERA. They don't care about, they don't even, I don't think care about strikeout rate. They care about your track man numbers, basically. That's what agents say. If you have a reliever and a team is talking to you, they care about track man numbers. How do I know this is the case? Jeremy Jeffress had a good ERA last year, mm -hmm. was, he got saves. Seems like a guy who's had saves in the past. Seems like a guy who should be good. People are yelling about the fact that he got a, a minor league deal. Why did he get a minor league deal? He had the worst velocity of his career. You know what I mean? Think about what happened with Brad Hand. Established closer, available for anybody just to pick up all our waivers, just pay his $10 million salary. No, we want to save a couple million and, you know, we're not sure, blah, blah, blah. You know, so like uh, the, the market tells us. Pomerantz? Didn't have, I don't, how many saves do he have on his ledger? He had like four saves on his ledger. And the, what happens? They give him a three year, $30 million deal. Yeah. Will Smith too, really had like a partial season, I think with the giants. And I, I think he was also a, a COVID impacted player in 2020. So he, he started to pitch a little better late in the year. That's an unsettled situation in Atlanta that I would watch really closely. Smith could be I think a I'm top 10 closer Smith, if he's the guy. Yeah. I'm leaning Smith. I like Smith, but I would also say if I miss out on Smith and I'm looking for one of my darts in the late, late rounds, Chris Martin's a perfectly fine dart given how, how they have not committed to anybody yet and we're yeah. almost into March. Oh, and the money point I could just make, uh, Melanson got $3 million one, right? I yeah. don't think the, the general manager was like, I just signed my new closer for $3 million in one year. Like when I have a $30 million guy in my roster, like I think the general manager thought this is depth. And that's why the pieces coming from uh, um, uh, AJ Casavelli and Jeff Green uh, have said that it, it, Pomerantz and Pagan are battling it out and uh, Melanson's a seventh, eighth inning guy. So you know, whatever it's tea leaf, it's tea leaf reading. It's uh, one of my least favorite uh, parts, but also one of my most favorite. It's one of these things that I hate and I love. Um, and I'm always chasing, um, I'm chasing, I'm the stuff guy. I'm chasing stuff. I'm chasing, I know it's skills over roles and role matters most, but um, I'm, I'm chasing those hard throwing relievers that could close. I love them. A lot of great questions on today's show. So thank you for filling up our email inbox as you often do rates and barrels at the athletic.com. If you'd like to chime in on Twitter, he's at, you Saris. I'm at Derek Van Riper. I should point out if you're listening to the very end of this show, thank you for sticking around for 80 plus minutes. Again, uh, we are doing a listener survey for all of our podcasts here at the athletic. I'll put the link to that in the show description. So if you could take a minute to click through and give us some feedback that will help us continue to make some great shows. If you have not subscribed to the athletic yet, and you want to get in on the draft kit and all the other great content. We have three, 99 a month will get you there to begin at the athletic.com slash rates barrel and sleepers up. I got some power sleepers up. Uh, one of those guys on the power sleeper uh, list is, is one of my favorites in drafts this year. I got new pitch sleepers up uh, with, and, and there's a pirate on there that I don't, haven't talked about much here that I'm sort of hoarding as uh, as a guy that I want to get in drafts and not tell everybody about. So check out that piece. Um, and Ian Khan's dynasty ranks and just uh, stuff upon stuff upon stuff. It's, it's great. We got Michael Waterloo's points rankings. We got Al writing for us. We got Ron Chandler writing in the draft kit, all boom, sorts boom, of good boom. stuff in there. So be sure the to goat, check that out. Ron Chandler. That is going to wrap things up for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We are back with you on Friday. Thanks for listening.